Welcome to Harper Fox Trailblazer Talks. Today we are talking about the impacts of toxicity in the workplace and workplace empowerment with the incredible Dr Lizzie, founder of Release Your Potential. Welcome Dr Lizzie. Thank you, excited. Um, amazing to Yay. have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. So, to kick off, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey and how you came to found out Release Your Potential? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to go right back. I'm not going to have my whole life story, don't worry. We'll but take actually, it right back. <laughs> but actually, I think it's really relevant. I was born um, at 28 weeks with a 5% chance of survival. Oh, right. And I think at that point, I decided I was going to be determined. And I think that's the only reason I'm saying that, because it's, it's been a pattern through my life of determination. So um, I was a nurse and a midwife and worked in the NHS, worked abroad in several countries in the Far East and the Middle East. And then at the tender age of 31, which is pretty late, I joined the army as a nurse. Okay. And had an incredible career uh, as a nurse and a midwife. And then found myself offered to do all sorts of exciting things, apart from obviously deploying and going to quite dodgy places at times, um, to go down the academic route. And that was a real shock to me because I was told at school, not intelligent enough to university, you can't, no use, useless at sport. And I found myself running and sprinting for the army and swimming for the army and got offered this opportunity for a degree. And much to my shock, in nine months I got a first so that oh, wasn't wow. part of my plan because I thought I'm not meant to be going to university I'm not clever enough and then I was asked to do a master's and I thought yeah okay great crack on two modules into my master's I was told actually I think you should do your PhD and I thought what so at the time nurses were no nurses in the military were doing PhDs okay. because it was only doctors and I thought that's unfair we should all be doing it so yes. I put up a case that nurses should do PhDs. I thought, actually, if you're gonna put up a case and have some funding, I'll be the one. So, so I did that, and when I left, there were, um, annually, nurses were funded. So that was great. Wow. So the reason wow. I'm telling you that is that never ever believe what you're told. And actually, yeah. I've always had that philosophy from that moment of determination. If somebody gives you a hurdle, just jump higher rather than let it stop you. And so, I, I, in my, for my research, I was looking at the impact of military life on the family left behind. Again, that was a bit of a struggle in the fact that... Um, oh, this is very interesting. <laughs> yes. I've got so many questions, but I don't want to stop you. Okay, please continue. So I think that was interesting itself, because at the time there was so much research about um, serving personnel, and I, I said, no, absolutely not. We need to support the families. Because I'd experienced the deployment I'd gone and left my daughter behind. My husband had gone, deployed, and I'd been left behind with my daughter, not knowing whether we're ever going to see each other again. And so I'd had the whole gambit. So as a result wow. of that, there was a lot of interest in my research. And so I found myself traveling the world, speaking about my research. And as part of that, I realized that through my career up to that point, I was very much giving people a voice. So I was giving people, obviously, earlier on in my career with nurse, as a nurse and a midwife, giving vulnerable yes. patients a voice. And then through my research, I was giving army families a voice. And then, latterly, I was very privileged to find myself chair of nursing for an inter international committee of military medicine, global, wow. with a global responsibility for nursing. Um, very much in terms of empowerment and resilience. And so while I was head of resilience research and well-being and passionate about that, I suddenly realised that all the conversations I'd had a lot through my career was actually coaching. Mm, and that's when the yes, kind of the penny dropped. and drops. I thought, wow. And um, I can go into a bit about later on, if you want me to or now, whichever you prefer, about why, why I set up my business. But I think when I left the army... I just thought it's just natural for me to be a coach and, uh, you know, carry on doing workshops in resilience and helping people be the best they can be. Okay, let me pause you there because yes. I want to I want to hear all about all about that. That's kind of the the, the key topic. Yeah. But I also would love to ask some questions just yes. about the journey that you described, if that's okay. Yes, of course. So first of all, you talk about this piece of resilience. In your opinion. 
Is that something that's cultivated through the things that we've maybe gone through? Or is it a character trait that perhaps we are innately born with, yes. maybe prematurely or not? Yeah. Is it a combination of the two? I'd really love to hear your opinion yeah, on I that. Yeah, I think it's very much a combination of the two. Yeah. Yes. Now, you have to have some determination. I mean, I've always had the philosophy that every challenge is a learning opportunity. So, so yeah. much is to do, I like everything in life mindset. with mindset, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I think this has been a really interesting time, um, obviously, of the trauma of the pandemic, yeah. is that somebody might lose their job. Now, one person can interpret that I've been made redundant, that's the end of my life. Somebody else might think, wow, this is a great opportunity. opportunity. I've always wanted to set up my business, now's my time. Yeah. So it, I talk a lot about switching thinking because yes. How, yes. You can, how you can you can flip any thought into yeah. empowering you or disempowering you. Mm, absolutely. And actually, it's quite easy to flip the thought. Yeah. It's trying to continue with that is what can be very, very yes. testing, even in that moment. So when we come back to resilience, I think it's interesting because most people talk about resilience as bouncing back. Okay. I always talk about bouncing forward. Interesting, okay. Because you're never the same person yeah. as you are before the event. I agree with that. And I saw yeah. something the other day and it really made me think it resonated with me. Yeah. And it talks, we talk so much about, for example, trauma um, yeah. and the impact that that has on the brain. And, and that obviously, is so kind of overused, that word. Absolutely, yeah, I, I agree <laughs> with you. But then I saw something and it talked about actually the, the, um, the positive impacts on the brain that healing has. So we focus so much sometimes on the impacts mm. that maybe, you know, a scenario you've been through and the resilience that you've needed to go through that. But actually, do we focus on what great impacts the healing can have yeah. as well? Yeah. And our brain's incredible. Our brain, Absolutely. plasticity in the brain, and we yeah. won't go too sciencey, but, you know, our brain can change yes. like its motorways within the brain. Yes. So, and it's so much to do with our thinking. So, and it doesn't stop. Exactly. Is no, never we used stops. to think there was never like an stops. age limit. There is no, there Thank is no end. <laughs> So, okay, we went down a slightly sciencey route. <laughs> I'm going to pull it back and ask about. So, you were obviously a successful nurse and midwife in the NHS. Yep. And then you decided to join the army. Please tell me about that decision making process. Yes. Well, I think, you know, I think every time I loved working abroad, I'd worked yeah. in Hong Kong and the Middle East and so forth. Okay. And every time I came back to UK, it was like my career hadn't been um, progressed. It was, there was no recognition of my work abroad. So, so you always kind of went abroad and did work and then came back? No, I think, I think um, because I was in my, as I say, in my 20s, I had a couple of years abroad, came back to the NHS, or went out again oh, okay. and came back. Yeah. So, yes, I, I, just loved, I just loved being abroad. So it was a way of how can I progress in my career and still be abroad. The other issue, which was, was massive for me at the time, I'm actually I'm eighth generation army. And so that um, had... So you have had yes, the, an however, influence. Yeah. So, uh, but my parents put never, never any pressure on me to join the army. In fact, they almost said, you know, don't. But anyway, so, <laughs> so they didn't put the pressure on me. But I suppose it was inbuilt in me, that whole service thing. Mm. Uh, and the other thing at the time was... Um, at, Ironically, my parent, my mother particularly, put a lot of pressure on me to because she missed me when I was away. Yeah. And I was in this real conflict at the time because I didn't have all the awareness I have now of how can I keep my parents happy, this whole need for approval stuff yes. going on, yes. as we well know about, but still live the life I wanted to live. And yeah. I thought, actually, the army's perfect because having been brought up in the army themselves and spent many years in the army, they knew that if you're posted somewhere, you have no choice. So I thought, the fact I'm posted to Cyprus, I had no choice in that. They didn't have to know the fact that actually I put my posting requesting to go to Cyprus, <laughs> which was slightly dishonest, but actually, and they were really excited because they got married in Cyprus. So it was all kind of like, all full circle. So it just filled up. And actually, at the time when I joined the army, 93, it was an ama amazing time of, of fun and enjoyment. We didn't have, you know, all the Balkans and the, Afghanistan and Iraq so it was it was an amazing time um, of fun incredible incredible thank you for yeah. sharing and, yeah. and final question on this part of the journey and then we will go on to, to release your potential and the um, and the coaching side of things yeah. so I've got so many questions around that is you said that you had done your research I think for your PhD on the impacts of the families 
yes. that went, um, that had um, parents, I assume, um, or loved ones that went to the army yeah. or were deployed. What were your findings, just in brief? Yes. I'd be really interested yes. to hear. I think what was fascinating was, and I, when I did my research, it was in 2010, yeah. uh, 29, 2010, uh, 2009. So it was when it was a really rough time in Afghanistan where soldiers were, two or three soldiers were being killed weekly. And what happens mm. in the army is a whole garrison deploys. Okay. So suddenly you have four, 400 families that are suddenly single parents, yes. all of, all of, and generally, generically, it's, it's, you know, it sounds very old school, but it's the wife at home with the husband deploying, but obviously it doesn't always work because I've yeah. deployed. And, yeah. But anyway, that, that was the general gist. Yeah. So suddenly they became single parents. And what was fascinating was when their children were ill, when their husband was around, they went through a whole um, process of decision making. And, you know, they'd phone their mother, they'd look on the internet, they might go to the chemist, whatever. And actually calling out of hours was the last thing they did. What happened when they deployed, when their husband deployed, they short-circuited it and went straight to out of hours in panic. Okay. Now, what was very fascinating about this, they all were quite mostly were very disparaging about their husband's decision-making. That Their husband had nothing to do with the decision-making, but the very fact he was there yeah. helped them feel calm and rational. Yeah. And when he wasn't there, that's when the panic... And, of course, it had massive implications for the NHS because... If you've got a whole garrison deploying and you've got suddenly 400 single families mm. who potentially could all be accessing the NHS far more than they would be when their husband was around, mm -hmm. it has a, it had a real impact. Kind of a ricochet yeah, effect. Yeah, exactly. So Interesting, putting services yeah. in place to be aware, and it's just simple communication. Yes, this garrison is going to deploy, so you might get more calls. And the other thing at the time when I did the research was I was working um, in, the, in one of the biggest health centres as, as a nurse, and we used to provide a lot of psychological support. So they used to come in when things were going a bit right. Come on, let's have a cup of tea, see how you are. Not necessarily. They come in and say, Johnny's got a sore throat, but actually Johnny's sore throat wasn't the issue here. It was the fact that they were just at the end of their tether. And at the time, there was whole re-changing of the NHS and service provision. And what happened was that we it all went over to the NHS out of hours. Mm. And at that point, the NHS out of hours, as it is naturally, it's, it's very un under huge pressure. Yeah. So they haven't got time to be having a chat about how you're feeling today. It's like sore throat, right, okay, yeah, get treated, out you go. Yeah. So that whole psychological piece was being missed. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's another thing that I highlighted. Yeah, no, very interesting. We'll, we'll continue to have that conversation <laughs> offline. I'm very intrigued. Um, OK, so then that brings us to you have had this very successful yeah. NHS Army career. You then decided to set up your own business and go into coaching. So tell us a little bit more about that and maybe some of the achievements as well that you've had to date. Yes. So, yes, yeah, so I think having had that awareness that I'd given people a voice, it seemed natural to be a coach. So I was really excited to be a coach. And to be honest, if I'm up front, I never intended to have a business. OK. <laughs> what? Because when I was leaving the army, um, I was approached by a consultancy who yeah. just wanted me to work with them. And I thought, wait, marvellous. I can, you know, I'll go where they want me to do. I don't have to do any of the business stuff. I just do the work, do what I love, put my invoice in, job done. And of course... Covid hit. Well, no, before Covid, Brexit hit, yeah. and suddenly the, the nothing come from the consultancy. So I thought, oh, best. What can I do? Learn about running a business. So <laughs> yes, the, so that was that. But I think where the toxicity came in was looking back on my career. I was I was um, a victim at times. Mm. I was, and looking back, while I was very good at giving other people a voice, I didn't have my own voice. And as a result, I was a bit of a victim, but not even realising I was a victim. What was the pinnacle point where you thought, ah, hold on a minute, I, f I was a bit of a victim here, or I, I experienced this. Yeah. What, what led to that point, if you don't mind me yeah, asking? Yeah, of course, yes. So what happened was, yes, I was bullied a bit, but, you know, I was up for it. I don't blame, and I'm so grateful for every situation because I've learned so much. So one yeah. day I'd been undermined and I stood up a meeting and I said, enough is enough. And at that moment, I found my power. 
which I didn't even realise I didn't have. Mm. And I suddenly thought, right, at that moment, that was, I will never let anybody go through what I've been through, and I'm going to be on a mission to get rid of toxicity because it's, it destroys lives and it has to stop. Mm. And that set up, up on my mission to make a difference. Fantastic. Yeah. But the Fantastic. army, I'd just like to say, the army is an extraordinary organisation uh, to work for. So it was nothing to do, I think, but it was just, I attracted it. But I didn't even realise I attracted it. Well, I was going to say, I yeah. think that you can receive toxicity in any workplace. Yeah. We know that there's good yeah. and bad everywhere, from yeah. school environments, yeah, academia, exactly. and right through to the workplace. So yeah. completely understood. When you said you attracted it, what do you mean by that? That's an unexpected kind of thing yeah. for you to say. I didn't even realise I was attracting it, but I think it was just because I was vulnerable and I was needy. Okay. And needing people's approval. And I was very unsure. So, yeah, when I was on stage, yeah. I was, oh, yeah, I was like on fire. As soon as I was back in the office, I was like that little girl, that little scared girl who was just feeling vulnerable, needing approval, needing to be told I was doing a good job. And by definition, you know, I was not taking responsibility. I was needing other people to tell me it was okay, mm. rather than me taking responsibility of, of what I was doing. So what happened? So what happened? Because that's quite a huge realisation, yeah. one that I think we can probably all resonate yeah. with in yeah. some capacity. So what did you do then? How did you turn that I think, around? I think How did just, you find that power? Yeah, it is. I mean, I literally, it's, once you find it, you've never, I'll never lose it again. Okay. My whole energy changed, okay. my whole confidence changed, my whole demeanour changed, and everything everything changed. What, just overnight? Or did you need to do that, any work that, around yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, I mean, of course. I think that moment was a defining moment for me. And I think my passion to make a difference suddenly became so strong that I was, and I, you know, I support clients to find their purpose. Once I was so clear about my purpose, it takes everything away from us. Because when we need approval, we want to know we're okay. Yeah. And actually, when you suddenly have a purpose bigger than you, you forget yourself in that process. Yes, yes, yes. Because you are serving. Yes. It is literally exactly. the bigger purpose, it isn't is, it? Exactly. Yeah. So I think that was a big difference. But yes, I didn't understand about, you know, I can talk about it if relevant, but the drama triangle and how communication and mindset, I didn't even know about all this stuff. So I don't understand either. Exactly. I've exactly. never, exactly. I've never exactly. heard of the drama yeah. triangle. So um, no, I've I heard think, of the power and control yeah. wheel, but yeah. never the drama triangle. Well, the drama triangle, <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it, once you know, everything, everything opens up. Basically, we all, we, we all take on lots of different roles. Okay. So we naturally empowered adults. We then take on the parent, so the nurturing parent, how are you today, are you okay? Yeah. And then we come the critical parent, you do what I tell you. Okay. And then we have the child. So the child is the fun child, you know, jumping in a pool on holiday with your children and all that kind of stuff. Or it's the petulant child. No, I'm stamping my feet, I'm not doing that. Okay. What happens is when it gets out of kilter, and we flip into these all the time, what happens when it gets out of kilter the parent becomes a persecutor, the scared child becomes a victim, and the adult becomes a rescuer. Yeah, okay. And we see it play out all the time. You don't have to have three people. It can be us. We can flit into all yeah, these roles. Yeah, into these different roles. All these yeah. roles. So, so once you're aware of that, you see it everywhere. So, oh, you just, you just slipped into that persecutor. And then somebody else is a victim, but as soon as you're aware of it and you stop being the victim, which is why the bullying stopped at that moment, because I had my power, I became an empowered adult, I was no longer a victim, and a, a mm. persecutor has to have a victim to take mm. to their stuff. Mm. Very, very, very true. So it's having that awareness, yeah. thing, oh, I'm going down to that victim mode, or oh God, that's a bit persecuting. And, and, and re rescuing is where, you want to die, and there's a difference between helping, which of course we all want to do, to disempowering that person by taking over. Yes, yeah, understood, yeah. understood. Because then you're flipping into yeah. their role, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so how does that play out then in the workplace? Yes, how it work, plays out in the workplace is how we, how we behave and noticing. So I'll give you a little example. Um, this is at one point before I knew all this stuff, and then I realised I did know when I knew about it. 
Let, let's just take a completely different scenario. So say, for example, you got the train to work on a Monday morning yeah. and your train's late and you arrive at work a bit late. Now, actually, if you're an admin post, if it's five minutes late, it really doesn't matter. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but it's, yeah. not, it's not like you've got patients dying in front of you. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so you arrive at work and your boss says to you, you're late. Now, if, so they're persecuting yes. at that point. Now, if you're a victim, you say, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Like a little girl, I'm really yeah. sorry. So that perpetuates the victim stuff. Then you might get somebody else in the office who might then try and rescue you and say, but you can't help it if the train's late. So it's their kind of... And then this whole thing goes on. How you can change that completely? Somebody says, you're late. You can stay in adult mode. It's like, yes, isn't it annoying? Why are the trains always late on a Monday? Mm. How was your weekend? Mm. But I'll be honest, if that was one of my team or I was going to a client meeting and somebody did that, I would think, oh, you're quite rude because you've not acknowledged that you've, you are late. <laughs> you've not acknowledged that you are late and that I've been waiting for you. Now, I'm quite placid, so I yeah. probably wouldn't, but I can imagine yeah. other people I'm would. I'm just using that as a very yeah. silly example. And of yeah. course, there's all sorts of other communication goes yeah. on. And yeah. you know, it depends how late you are and if you're not normally late. And, you know, there's, um, but I'm uh, just explaining that to actually... To meet them at their level kind you know, of thing. You could, if somebody's persecuted, you can either react as a victim, I'm yeah. so sorry, like a little girl that's scared... Or you can go into adult mode and, and b- give a logical answer. Yeah, I'm really sorry. Okay. However, it was beyond my control. The train was late. I couldn't do anything about it. That is an adult response. Okay, interesting. Really, really interesting. So, okay. So is that what can then exacerbate toxicity in the workplace? So say, for example, rather than maybe there's one bullying person in the workplace, which again, yeah. I think people have experienced, what about if you're in an environment where it is it does feel toxic? It's very, I don't know, clicky, or you don't yeah. quite fit in, or um, maybe you are the odd one out. How would you maybe deal with, with that kind of yeah. scenario? And I think before I go on to answer that question, just one thing that's really in, that you've just highlighted about fitting in. Yeah. Fitting in is the opposite of belonging, mm. interestingly. It, it, yeah. Because we all want to belong, because it's all back to that prehistoric stuff where if we didn't belong, we'd be thrown out, we wouldn't get the lion's share, literally, and we'd die. So we yeah. all need to feel And we're fueled belong. for connection. Exactly, aren't we? we're fueled for connection, absolutely. Yeah. It's one of our fundamental needs. Yeah. And so as a result of that, if we don't feel we fit in, we desperately change ourselves like a chameleon in order to belong. But actually, the only person we can belong to is ourselves. Mm. And so when we want to fit in, we become that square hole in a round peg or whatever it is and change ourselves to, to be part of that environment and as a protection thing. And so, and that never works. So... Back to the whole toxic environment thing, it's when I think egos are, are rife, you know, everybody's point scoring yeah. and it's a cultural thing. Yes, there might be one particular bully that is not behaving well, but they are in a culture that supports that. And you do, and particularly in higher, and most all organisations to one level degree are a hierarchical um, organisation just for the fact you get promotion, by definition, it's a hierarchical organisation. And it's when that hierarchy is being abused Mm. and they're using their position as a way to manipulate or to dictate. And then it becomes embedded in that culture. Interesting. So then, as individuals, that goes back to then us. Yes. Kind of... Elevating. To rise above it. Yeah, exactly. and so, being ourselves and owning that. Yeah, exactly. So this is where the empowerment comes in. Mm. Now, the, why I'm on a mission to get rid of toxicity is I'm on a mission through helping every leader I come across to own their awesomeness within them, find the confidence that's already there. Okay. And then when you are feeling empowered, you can empower your team. Yes. And there's no place for toxicity because the whole culture changes. 
very interesting. I'm trying to just take it in. <laughs> I'm trying to take in some of the words as well. I'm like, you find your awesomeness. Like everything is so positive and confidence yeah. and elevating. Yeah. And we all have confidence within us. Every baby's born with confidence, but it's just stuff that happens in our life that knocks it out of us. So it's never a question, you know, when you hear people, I'm not a confident person. You are a confident person, you just don't yeah. acknowledge that you're a confident person. And it just takes a bit of unpicking to find that confidence that's already within. Can you share maybe something that's quite simple, maybe one or two things that can help to unpick some of that confidence? Certainly to have... To find to, our awesomeness, yes, awesomeness yeah. Dr Lizzie. <laughs> yeah. I think the first thing, the simplest thing, is just to notice what your body's doing. Okay. Because when we're scared and when we're feeling vulnerable, we sort of tend to scrunch up. Yes. So just imagine you're Superman or Superwoman. And literally, because what happens is our brain, clearly our brain's connected to our body, clearly. But what happens is if our body's confident and empowered, that tells our brain things are okay. So our stress hormones reduce, and they've mm. done research in Harvard where they had two groups of people, one for two minutes were like standing like Superman, Superwoman, and the other group were like all scrunched up. And in two minutes, 20% difference in stress hormones up or down. Wow, I did not know this. Yes. Yeah. So that's a quite a quick fix way yes, then, exactly. isn't it? To kind of write, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm feeling like this mentally, but I'm going to kind of position yes. myself and hold myself in a confident and open way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you can... I'm see, feeling better already. <laughs> but you can look across the street. You can see somebody's having a good day or a bad day. Just let you stride in confidently or yeah. they're all kind of on their phone crunched up. So that's one really simple thing. And so certainly yeah. now, now we're in such a virtual world... You know, I, I've now got a standing desk, so whenever I'm coaching or giving presentations, I'm always standing because you have more energy. Okay. But, you know, if you're having a tricky conversation, and that's in our whole conversation about what's a tricky conversation, but yeah. if you're having one a, where you want to be your best version of yourself, then do it standing up if you're on the phone. Or, you know, if you're giving a presentation on, on Zoom or, or online, put your laptop on a box. <laughs> So just so you're standing. But if you're in a meeting where you can't suddenly stand up and go like that, you just like just notice what your body's doing. Just make sure your feet are grounded on the floor and you're, you know, sitting up. So mm -hmm. that's one thing. The other thing is what you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is what what you know, what language are you using? Are you using empowering language in your in your head and in your what you're saying? And are you focusing on success or are you focusing on oh, what this is all going wrong, you know, so it's a little triangle. Because, because in doing so, in focusing on that kind of positive outcome, then yes. you're more likely, I guess, to obtain it. Yes. Exactly. Can that work that way in arguments then? Yes, I mean, I think an argument's the whole thing. I think an argument is the drama triangle, 100%. Yeah. 100%. So in an argument, it's, 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 it's avoiding the accusing persecutor role that we can so easily fall into. Yes. Of the you, 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 you. Yeah, and I want to make you feel bad because <laughs> you've made me feel bad. Yeah, exactly. You've hit my confidence. And I'm going to get it right. And then we yeah. go into the so it's the it's the less, less talking about feelings because no one can argue I'm feeling like this. Yes. Opposed to you've done this and you've done that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's also and this is a, another conversation about integrity versus morality. Integrity going into conversation that you want the best outcome and not prove that I'm right or you're wrong. Yes, and that actually we're, we're kind of, it, we're both here to resolve this problem. Yes. We're not against each yes. other. So you take the person, and it's so difficult, and this is, yeah. this is practice. Well, I think when it's emotions involved, yeah, exactly. it is, isn't it? Yeah. It is, it, it's low, you know, lots of practice and lots of unpicking and things, but it's, it's what is the outcome of this conversation that we both want to almost like an agenda for a meeting but i know in a conversation when you might be in the kitchen and you're having a big slanging match it's it's more difficult but it's it's having that aware whoa whoa and at home we actually say oh drama tri drama triangle alert <laughs> stop regroup <laughs> but it's all a bit of a joke but it's Getting out of that, and this is where the drama triangle and the awareness is so important because it shows up everywhere. Over emptying the dishwasher to like somebody asking you, emailing you at work with something, you know. Okay, so I have a question, and then we'll we'll move, we'll move on to something else. I'm completely unpicking your brain at the moment. What about if you are going in with that attitude? So it could be in your personal life yes. or in the workplace of resolution. 
but you are dealing with somebody that is not in that same place. Yes. And that's a challenge. And sometimes you have to say, this is not the right time to have this conversation. Okay. So it might be a case of let's yeah. halt, let's come back and yes. reflect, or go, go and reflect, and now let's come back together and try and have this as a positive discussion. Because yeah. communicating with someone that is angry will never work. Yeah. Because they're in so much in their heads. For all may probably good reasons, you'll never have a proper conversation. Okay. So it's best to be assertive and say, look, just not the right time right now. And we move on. Okay, incredible. Well, thank you so much. That was extremely helpful. <laughs> I feel like it's a um, coaching and a therapy <laughs> session at the same time. I'm feeling very empowered. Um, tell me maybe about a couple of sacrifices that you've had along the way. Yeah, I think the, I think the biggest one probably was stepping off the tarmac when I went to Afghanistan, wow. not knowing if I was ever going to see my daughter again. Wow. That Huge. Was, that was probably... I mean, that is unbelievable, actually, yeah. when you think about that. And I think there was an interesting moment. I thought at that moment, literally, physically, standing on the tarmac, I'll never forget it, with a, a long line of us all in our military uniform to get on the plane. And I had that real thinking, oh my goodness, am I being an irresponsible mother here? But yeah, I knew I had to go. I knew I was running, um, managing a team. I had a big responsibility to do out there to support all the military personnel out there. And it was never a question that I would not go. How could I not? What sort of leader would that be when potentially, if I didn't go, somebody else could go in my place and be killed? So yeah. it was never a question of not going, but I, I did have that moment. And I think the other thing, actually, it's interesting when you deploy, you have to write your wills. I wrote all my letters <sighs> in case in case I had a letter in my, and I, I think uh, she's still, my daughter's still got it, actually, but she's never opened it, but a letter in case I never return. So you have a sort of, all this stuff to do before you deploy. And are in these case things you that you are that, they, that the army, for example, would suggest that you do? Yeah, you have to. Well, you, don't, you always yeah. have to write a letter. They don't say, but uh, they, they encourage you to write a letter. Yeah, of course. But actually, yeah. when I'd written all those letters, you know, to my husband and daughter and family and all that kind of stuff, it was a real kind of relief actually mm. to think, okay, well, I've done my bit. Um, I put everything in and place. And you, have, that to, you I can. have to have a will before you deploy. You have to have a will. You cannot deploy without a will for all these various reasons. Yeah, that is that must really make you think about life and death. Like, like really, yeah. you know, we we have these conversations very loosely, and maybe um, we're from different environments. So I guess working for the NHS, you are dealing with life and death. Yeah. Being in the army, of course, you are dealing with life and death. So it's probably worse for me. You know, I'm in a corporate world, and you're not. You sort of see things on the TV, but you's not talking about life yeah. and death every day. That is not yeah. that not the case. And. Yeah. It's given me a bit of a reality check, actually, you saying that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think, yes, I think that, that was probably... Yeah, so I suppose that, that's a sort of that sort of sacrifice. But I think also the sacrifice... Is it sacrifice generally with family time, I think? You yeah. Know, when I was doing my PhD, I was working in a very busy um, military job that I was having to sort of work until one o'clock in the morning to get my PhD done because I was busy with my normal job. So, yes, but I think it's like everything in life. You have the focus of the common goal, you yeah. know, of the, where, where you want to go, what path you're on. And we all know that if you th talk to any athlete, you know, any, obviously we just had the Winter Olympics. If you talk to any of those athletes, they've chosen to make huge sacrifice yeah. because you know, that gold medal is their absolute mission and therefore everything else has to fall by the wayside. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. But it's the You're communication. You're giving me lots of food for thought. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the communication because you have, it, the most important thing with all this is you have, it's getting buy-in from those around you, your family. Yeah, you it's know? that support network. Because they're it? sacrificing too. It's not oh, just yeah. us that sacrifice. They're making yeah. huge sacrifices. So... It's having those conversations. Genuinely, I feel like we could talk all day. Yeah, <laughs> like there, is, there are so many elements. I'm like, I need to understand this. I'm always trying to learn. So I'm like, how do I get better at this? And yeah. how can I heal Lots that? Lots of time for further conversations. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Um, what I want to do is we touched a little bit on achievement. Can we go back to that and maybe touch on a couple of achievements that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, I think one of my biggest achievements is when I was appointed Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. There's wow. only 700 in the world, I think. And I think 
the reason that was I felt so proud of that because I was reward it was a reward for or acknowledgement not even a reward it was an acknowledgement of the impact I'd made globally yeah. for supporting nurses with their empowerment and that I think that was not the award itself but it was the fact that um, I was obviously doing an okay job at it so no, you were, no, you were doing an awesome job <laughs> So yeah, I think, and obviously to do that you had to have a PhD, and that was another that was another sense of achievement. But I I think the biggest achievement I feel now is living my purpose and being so passionate for making a difference. And as part of that, I have to be the best version of me in order to support others to be the best version of them. Yeah. So the the self development I have done has been huge, and I'm. Every day is a learning day. At times it can be painful, at times it can be... But you have to have a breakdown to have a breakthrough. Yes. And I see yes. every setup, you know, every setback is a setup. Absolutely. So, yes, I suppose it's... it's. I'm so grateful that I've got that philosophy, really. Yeah, absolutely. I resonate with that wholeheartedly yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay, so final question before our lightning round if there was one thing in the world of business that you could change, what would that be? That we everybody, every single person focuses on serving and not selling. Mm, mm, that is powerful. Tell me a little bit yeah. more about that. I think, I think, I mean, I suppose at the moment there's, obviously it's, it's sad to see so many businesses struggling and so forth. Yeah. And some businesses, I'm not saying some businesses, some probably some sections of business are so wanting to sell but they're not actually, they wanted to sell because they want their business to survive. And I totally get that being in a business myself. But folks, not focusing on the client or the customer is focusing on, I need these sales, I need these sales. And the whole customer journey is forgotten in that process. Now, I'm sure there are lots of people listening to this might scream and shout, I'm always serving. And I know 99% of people, hopefully they are. But it's just having that mindset to think, I'm doing it for the better good of that client, that customer. And if they, if they want my product, great. But if they don't, that's okay too. I think we all get bombarded with people want to sell their product. I don't actually want any, I just don't want that right now. I don't need new windows in my house, thank you very much. And so they, well, you, you do really. It's like, no, I don't. I mean, that's a silly example, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's doing the serving, like how can I help you best? What can I do most for you? And that whole switching of the philosophy to serving. Fantastic. Fantastic. And then the irony of it all is, is when you're serving, you your clients come naturally. I'll say you're bringing naturally. business anyway. So yeah. it all works out well for everyone in the end. Mm. Brilliant. Dr. Lizzie, absolutely brilliant. Like I said, I could talk to you all day. You've shared some really practical advice and some very thought-provoking um, topics as well. So thank you so much oh, for joining us. It's been a joy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so what we'll do now is we will go into our quick fire questions. Yes. It's going to be um, gunfire. Bang, 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 bang. Yes, <laughs> yeah. you can tell you're from the army. I'm like, oh my goodness, what? <laughs> you can, you can go, we'll go into our quick fire questions. Yes. I have around 60 seconds. Um, just go with your first answers yes. and we'll shoot straight into yes. them if that's okay. Okay, let's go. What do you do for fun? Uh, we had a blow up hot tub we bought in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect you to say this. <laughs> okay. okay. And I just love sitting in the hot tub with family, with friends, if you've got a glass fist, all the better. And, oh, it's amazing. But also I do cold water swimming. Oh, do Which you? I love doing. I, it's sort of a mixture of whether it's fun, but it's just so empowering. Exhilarating. So empowering, yes. Amazing. Okay, yes. brilliant. Both water focused. <laughs> yes. Um, what does equality mean to you? Equality. Equality. That everybody, and it's obviously, clearly, everybody's treated equally, but whatever level. Yeah. So I think we can all say, yes, we have equality, we have diversity, we have all this stuff. These are just words. Yes, yes. It's generally making everybody feel they've got a voice, no matter mm. who they are, where in the organisation. Beautifully said. Yeah, beautifully said. What would you say to your younger self and why? It's all going to be okay. Aww. <laughs> but, you know, when things don't go well, the learning you get is amazing. So trust, 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 trust. It's all going to work out as it's meant to be. And trust that process. Yes. And who inspires you and why? Huge number. I could have, there could be hours on this. I think <laughs> for me, one person that really inspires me, other than the usual Brenny Browns and all the yes. wonderful people like that, Joe Wicks. 
Oh, interesting. Yes. Okay. And, and I've met why? him. Have you? He's awesome. So Joe Wicks, simply because he was 100% serving. Yes. You know, he, he started off by going into the local park, offering his classes for free. Two people turned up and he was determined that no matter what, he would make a difference. And look at him now. Look what he did in lockdown with his free yeah. PE session. So that is the ultimate of serving, of wanting to make a difference, changing people's view of exercise, realising you don't need any equipment, you don't have to join a fancy gym. Just do it. Just do it. Incredible, incredible. And what makes an exceptional leader? I think when you, when you believe in your team more than they believe in themselves, Yes. When you've got integrity in every yes. bone of your body. Yeah. Courage to be vulnerable. Yes. And leading from the front, behind, up, down. <laughs> in every way, in every <laughs> exactly. capacity. Yeah. Fabulous. What does sustainability mean to you? We all know, obviously, about the sustainability as in the environment. I think, for me, it means leaving the world better than you arrived in it. Yes on every level in the fact that sustainable you know I'm I am my own business if I don't look after myself mm. and I fall down I'm not sustainable and so sustainability really nice in sustainability in you know if you've got a team what can you do to support your team so they stay there you know what can you do about retention so sustainability in personality health well-being not just you know recycling and all that kind of stuff that's excellent Really nice, really nice take on it. And a final point for you, Dr. Lizzie, tell us an inspiring word or motivational phrase. Yeah, I think we've already covered it, but for me, it's we are all awesome. We have everything within us, nothing needs to be fixed, nothing's broken, just needs a conversation to find it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Really, really, oh, really good. You. It's been a joy. No, Such it has. a joy. Yeah, it has. It's been, I can feel the motivational, <laughs> awesome energy exuding from you. And um, yeah, and yeah there's, like I said, there's been some really thought provoking things that you've touched on as well. So, yeah, yeah thank you. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, really good.